Ferguson, if you'd come up here, well, uh, we'd like for uh, uh, you to visit with us a little while. Mr. Marks, you can kind of uh, do to him like he did to you, and make that's all right. When you need to go, just just that is perfectly all right. Um, we have uh, uh, also in Pawnee, the date being September fifteenth, nineteen seventy-one, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the great names in Oklahoma politics, uh, a person who has. Uh, been very active in his party, and I believe at one time, were, were, were you at one time chairman of your par of the Republican Party? Uh, eight years as chairman of the Republican Party. No, you were not a chairman. No. But who's uh, been quite active in the Republican Party, who's uh, served in many c political p capacities, who has uh, uh, been involved in early newspapering, and who is... Uh, uh, at one time was a candidate for the governor of the state of Oklahoma re representing his party. Yes, uh -huh. that was uh, uh, that's right. state senator eight years. Uh -huh. But uh, we will get all this from Mr. Ferguson. I think that to start off with, let's ask uh, uh, where you were born and uh, who your parents were, Mr. Ferguson. I was uh, born in Willow Springs, Missouri. Or on a farm near Willow Springs. My father was a native of Tennessee, and my mother was from near Springfield, Illinois. Her parents are Southern people. Her father, William Young, was a veteran of the Mexican War and made the trip with Donovan the expedition from Westport Landing, which is now Kansas City, to Monterey, Mexico. It took them 18 months to travel overland. He was also a, war, a Civil War veteran. He was born in South Carolina, but was in the Union Army. And her, her mother was from Kentucky. My father's people are from Virginia, North and South Carolina, and Tennessee. I came to Oklahoma after World War One, I, I was in World War One with the Missouri National Guard, and so I'm a comparative newcomer to to Oklahoma. I came to Pawnee and entered the abstract business, and a couple of years later, oh, in conjunction with a couple of other fellows, went into the newspaper business, and. Uh, I've been in that business more or less all the time until I retired from it a few years ago. Was there any other newspapers on the No, there's never been. Uh, there was only one paper. We, we bought it. Uh, later on, there were two other papers established here. But uh, they have been consolidated with the paper that my son now operates. Oh, uh, well, of course, George Berry was here in the First National Bank, and uh, he wasn't active in there. He was a farmer and a stockman. He'd been here a long time. Uh, he'd been here before the opening, in, uh, which was in 1893, and had uh, leased land from the Indians at that time. He was very active. Brewington Hardware was one of the main stores, Mark's Department Store, Cat's Department Store, uh, Cecil J. Drug Store, and so forth. Uh, I believe that Mr. Mark said something about Mr. Brewington being a Ford dealer. Mr. Brewington operated the first whole uh, state agency for the Ford Motor Company, but the agency was located in Oklahoma City. He lived in Pawnee at that time. I get a lot of this information that's handed down to me, talking to the old timers, but the first telephone line in Oklahoma was built from Pawnee to Perry. And they uh, tell the story about an old Indian that uh, induced to talk over the phone, and he uh, uh, called another Indian on the other end of the line and let him talk to him. He said, oh, I speak all kind of language. 
they talk phony, they talk English. Now, that line is uh, was the nucleus for the building of a uh, telephone system in the state of Oklahoma. They, uh, of course, they were the prominent men of uh, this town and the probably the most prominent was Phone E. Bell, Major Gordon W. Levy. Uh, there's some great stories about him as a showman. He was a real showman. And in the old days, and not so long ago, the national banks issued currency. They were uh, sold so many uh, $10 notes, uh, 20s, and so forth, whatever denomination they wanted. And the president and the cashier of the bank had to sign these notes, uh, these, uh, this national bank currency. Uh, I presume uh, anybody that's 30 years old knows about the national bank currency. But anyhow, he used to carry them in sheets. They come three on in the sheet. And then when he's in the show business and get into a restaurant or go to pay a bill, he carried a little pair of scissors with him and he'd slip off a $10 bill or a $20 bill, whatever the nomination was on that sheet, sign it and hand it to the to whoever was collecting for it. And lots of times he had some consternation among the waiters and waitresses and the cashiers of the different restaurants where they'd go to eat. In 1907, so the story goes, when there was a slight, uh, oh, we call it a panic in the old days, and uh, the banks were not putting out any money if they could help it, and some of them didn't have the money to put out. But he was the president of the Pony National Bank. That's where he signed these notes. That's where he could sign these certificates. He was president of the Arkansas Valley National Bank in Pony. And he closed his circus along the fall of 1907 and uh, brought uh, it to Pony. He had his winter quarters here in Pony. Kept his wild animals and everything and, uh, over here in some timber, and, uh, which is now in front of the place where he kept them now in the city. And uh, he brought his whole show into Pawnee in uh, the fall of 1907 when there was a, this panic was on. He had uh, the, the old fellow that ran a dray. We don't have them anymore, but they, of course the dray was full of horses and mules. He had him back up to the one of his cars on the uh, show cars, and he brought most of his money, if not all of it, in silver dollars. They backed this dray up to the car and took a scoop shovel and shoveled the money into the dray. And when he got to the bank, they backed up to the bank and shoveled it in uh, to, the, uh, to where it could be carried into the vault. Of course, that attracted uh, the attention of everybody in the community. They all gathered around to see that silver shoveled in. And uh, the word got out that that bank has plenty of money. So that was one of his stunts of pulling a, a, a showmanship. He was a great showman, I know not about that. I uh, I played pitch with him lots of times up at his home, and uh, he, he liked to play. His wife was a wonderful woman. His wife was a, an expert marksman, or markswoman, I guess you'd call it, and so was Pawnee Bill, or he thought he was. And he used to shoot marbles from the, with a 22 rifle that May, his wife, would hold between her thumb and forefinger. And one time, when he was putting on this demonstration, she dropped her little finger of that hand down to where when he shot the marble out, he also hit her finger, and he shot off the, little, the end of her little finger, the right hand. She was a Quaker girl from Philadelphia that he met while on the trip, but she was a rip snorter. She was a good woman and a fine, uh, very entertaining, and a perfect wife for a showman. Oh, I'd 
think he did. There's, uh, of course, that I, I don't know. I can't speak from it. I can't speak from personal experience, but uh, or from actual knowledge of it. But he was supposed to have been associated with pain in an attempt to get the uh, Cherokee Strip open for settlement. And the boomers came in at the time in 18, prior to 1893. The Pony Indians were moved here from Nebraska about 1876. The Pony Post Office is one of the oldest in the state, having been established at that year. I think Paul Husky and Pony were established uh, at about the same time. At that time, this was known as the Pony Indian Post. That was the name of the no, Pony Agency. That was the name of the post office. Later on, the word agency was stricken. Pony Indians came in here, and the school was established, and an agency established here, which provided uh, services for five tribes in this area, the Pawnees, the Ponkas, the Otos, the Caws, and the Tonkawas. They call the uh, Cherokees and the Choctaws, the Comanches, and the Seminoles, and the Creeks, the five civilized tribes. These boys up, these folks up here, these Indians laughing, they call themselves the five uncivilized tribes, or the five tribes at this agency. They are, and uh, continue today, to be the five tribes of this agency. The school has been, was been closed over about 10 years, and it's now a rest home. They... The Indians were uh, a very uh, peculiar but defined group of people. I recall one time that, that since I was here that we were voting bonds or trying to vote bonds to build a highway. And those in the early days of building highways in Oklahoma, uh, the state didn't pay for them. The counties had to provide the money. And Pawnee voted the $300,000 bond issue to build us the Highway 64 through, through the county. And we were voting on that bond issue, and everybody was trying to get everybody out to vote they could. There was some opposition to it. And one Lloyd Brewington, the hardware merchant, was helping to haul voters to the polls, and he got a hold of old man Leading Fox. I was either Leading Fox or Walking Son, I forget which one. And he hauled out to the polls at uh, the Liberty Township to vote. Well, the Indians... Uh, were practically 100% Republicans at that time, and they'd been taught to vote with wherever they saw the eagle on the ticket. So not many of them could read and write. Well, they took this old Indian as either walking son or leading fox. Uh, Lloyd took him to the polls and explained to him when you get in there how to mark that to vote yes, vote yes, and where to make the mark. He let him go into the polling place in, in the school, little schoolhouse out west of town. In about five minutes, he came running out there with his ballot in his hand. And the precinct uh, inspector was behind him, hollering at him to come back. He ran out the car where Lloyd was, and he says, Where Eagle? No Eagle. No Eagle. <laughs> that uh, condition, of course, doesn't exist at the present time because there's very few of the Indians that are not pretty well educated and good citizens. They were wonderful, gave wonderful service in two wars. Many of them were killed in action. And uh, they, they, they did well. This pony, uh, uh, I've thought of something now about its, uh, some of its distinctions. It's produced three chief justices of the Supreme Court. Sort of a coincidence, we're in the Tulsa Judicial District. We, per, we elect one judge, and Tulsa used to elect three, and it's all in the same district. So the judge from this district, this district holds court in Tulsa, and in that way he becomes quite well acquainted. While Judge... Uh, Neil E. McNeil and Judge Edward R. McNeil and Judge Thurman S. Hurst were all elected to the Supreme Court, and each one became a Chief Justice. The McNeils were brothers. Well, the McNeils were mighty.
the good citizens. Uh, any later moved to Thompson, practiced law there until his death. And Edwin R. stayed here, and he died a couple of years ago. They were outstanding attorneys and uh, good lawyers. This was formerly, uh, now this is for my time. I'm speaking from hearsay and what people have told me now and from what I've read, which I know to be true. This was the uh, court. Court was held here for the Osage Nation. The Osages had no no court was held over there, but it was held in Pawnee, and all and all cases from the Osage were brought over here for trial. Sometimes they bring over so many prisoners for trial that they had them to chain them to the trees in the courtyard until they got to them. And that's the story that goes. I don't know how true that is. But uh, I do know that they tried those cases over here until after statehood. They were tried here and later. Now, not, not just that time either, because a few years before statehood, they began drawing jurors from Pawnee County and taking them over to Paul Husky and holding court over there. I don't know too much about early newspapers in Oklahoma because I say I've been here only 51 years. And uh, when I came here, Pawnee it was, a, it was a town, uh, oh, nearly 30 years old at that time. Let's see, it was, three, it, was uh, 60, it was 26 years old at that time. And I, when I, in the early day, I couldn't tell you too much about it, but there was about the first day of the opening, according to the old files that we have, uh, there was a paper published here. Somebody brought in a bunch of type and a print and press and went to publish the paper. And uh, there have been as many as three papers in Pawnee, but generally there were just two, and uh, finally, like most places, it dwindled down to one. There's been only one paper in Pawnee, except for a short period of time in the last uh, 50 years. But there was a period there for about a year that there was two or three papers here, but they were not and not anymore. Uh, George Berry used to tell a story about the opening here. He was, uh, I say, was a cattleman and leased in land the Indians before the opening. But he said that the opening, uh, they laid out the town site of Pawnee, and a, a settler could come in and homestead a lot, or two lots, or he could go homestead 160 acres if he'd get it. If he, if he wanted to live in town, he could, could homestead a couple of lots. Now he said that he was here before and knew things pretty well, and he, he, didn't, he didn't take a a homestead, and he was not qualified. I don't think he was qualified to take a farm homestead. But he saw around town there was a fellow homesteaded a lot, and he put up a grocery store, and another one next to him put up a blacksmith shop, and another one put in a newspaper, and uh, all kinds of, another one put in a saloon, and another in a drugstore, and so forth, and he said he wanted to go in business, and he didn't know exactly what to do. But the sign he decided he'd put in a bank. Well, he had a tent, and he stretched it on the lot that he homesteaded, entered, got him a goods box to sit on, took a shingle and rolled on the bank and hung it on the tent, outside the tent, and sat down on the goods box and waited for customers to come in. And there was... The first customer came in, and after an hour or two, left $10. That was all he got that day. And the next day, there's a man come in and left $20. He said the third day, there was a man come in and left $50. And it just gave him so damn much confidence, he put in $10 of his own money. That's the customer. Oh, yes, he told about 
about the first Indian that died here. The Indians, the Pawnees, were in the habit of burying their, of putting their dead above ground and covering with rocks. And they hadn't been here very long. Well, they'd been here quite a while, I guess, but they kept burying them that way or disposing of the bodies that way. And the uh, agent insisted that they should put them in a coffin and in a casket and bury them on the ground. So an old Indian died, and they got some boards at the local sawmill and made him a casket. But they made it too short, so they knocked out the end of it and let his feet stick out, and they loaded him on the running gears of a wagon and hauled him out to cemetery. That was the first, that was his story, the first Indian was buried here. I do know that uh, after I came here, they discovered uh, some skeletons out east of town, which were said to have been Indians that had been buried above ground, and one of them was a uh, skull was brought in here, and I believe a complete skeleton was brought in here and left at the high school, but when the skull is some 50 years ago, that has been probably 50 years after the, after the uh, Indian died. Mr. Marlin and Mr. Kerr and I bought the Courier Dispatch in 1922, I believe it was. Well, later on, Mr. Kerr, uh, I sold to Mr. Marlin, and then Mr. Kerr sold to Mr. Marlin, and a few years later, I went in newspaper business at Cleveland. That is, I still continued to live here, but I had a partner, and he was in the paper over there. Then in 1940, I came, I came back and uh, put in a, and established the Pawnee Chief. And uh, I remember that it was a little hard about getting subscriptions, so I hit on the idea that everybody bring in a live possum. I'd make him give me a year's subscription. And I had possum running out of my ears that fall. I remember we, we cooked chicken cups, and I had at one time I had six chicken cups full of possums out in front of the, the, uh, of the newspaper office, but I sure built up a prescription subscription list. Did you get renewal for possums? No, no, that, that, that ended with the first paper was all in it. It didn't last but, oh, six weeks or something like that. That's what I mean. It was just simply a stunt. And uh, I gave the, that's when I turned most of possum loose and gave them away. They uh, got too big a problem to feed. When did you uh, join the politics? Oh, I've been interested in politics all my life. I was interested in politics when I lived in Missouri. I ran for county clerk when I was 21 years old in Missouri and got beat, I remember, by 11 votes. <laughs> and I thought, I, and I guess it was a good thing. Later on, I was in the newspaper business back there for a while. Then I was in the Postal Service until I went into the uh, Army in World War in 1917. And... Uh, Oh, when I went to Oklahoma politics, well, about as soon as I got out of here, I guess. I don't know. I was interested in them. I attended the state conventions and the county conventions from the time I landed here, and I have continued it. I think everybody should be interested in politics, uh, maybe not, maybe to a limited extent, but it's politics is everybody's business. It's the uh, science of government, and uh, the government is the biggest business that we have, and if we don't elect the right kind of people and take the proper interest in it, we can't expect to have good government. Well, I remember the city council in Pawnee, 24. Oh, having enough money to run the, just like it is now, just like 
plug it in. I don't have enough money to run the operate things. Of course, we didn't try to spread out as much as we did now. We didn't didn't spend money like they do now. We didn't have the facilities. We didn't have. We had a pretty good water system that had been provided for, but it went sour on us. And later on, after I was off the council, they had to change and put in a big lake. And we have a good we have a good water system now. About hundred. Uh, hundred acres of lake, or hundred and ten, something like that, up north down, and it's it never has. We've never been short of water since. We were short. We used to get out of the Black Bear when I came here, and the uh, oil companies polluted the stream up around Garber and up toward Enid, and uh, then they paid for. Uh, they were sued by the McCollum McCollum lawyers representing the city of Pawnee. And a judgment was obtained sufficient to build this a big lake up north town. And that's the way. Incidentally, I had an old courthouse, and I came here, an old stone courthouse. And while I was in the Senate, I introduced a bill to levy a two mill tax or a mill tax, and to take all the court and take the court fund. And hold that levy and the fund until a sufficient amount was accumulated to build a courthouse. Now that was unconstitutional if anybody wanted to contest it. But the oil companies and the big taxpayers thought it'd be easier to pay for uh, pay a small levy than it would be to pay interest on bonds for a long time. So when sufficient money was accumulated. The present courthouse is built. It's a nice structure. Yeah. And it was paid for the day, the day it was built. It was paid for. And never was any. And I take considerable pride in that. That we got that done. Incidentally, there's the first, the only highway that I know of in Oklahoma that is built by an act of the state legislature is in Pawnee County. The uh, McElroy Township in this county voted bonds to build a highway. Well, the commissioners didn't know much about that. At that time, we had township government. The township trustees didn't know very much about building roads, and most of that money, or a good part of it, was squandered before then. The road didn't last over, th- over two or three months after they had it built. A hard, uh, they put what they called a hard surface road there, but it wasn't very hard. And that money laid there in the county, in the township treasury for two or three years, and I introduced a bill in the legislature to require the state highway commission to take that money and to add to it such money as was necessary and build a paved highway through McElroy Township, north to south. Um, William H. Murray, off of a bill, was governor at the time, and he wouldn't sign the bill. But they did let it become a law by, uh, after the legislature adjourned, and it became a law. And the Highway Commission not only built the highway, but they also built it, made it a part of uh, the state highway in 99. And uh, that's the way a good uh, part of that state highway 99 was financed. I was in the Senate from 1925 to 1933. And uh, so in 1925, who was governor? Ed Trapp. Trapp was governor. Yeah. Uh, was, uh, were, were you in when the, uh, the Senate and the Walton? No, Walton was out the year before I went in. Ed Trapp became governor. He was lieutenant governor, and Walton was. Oh, Ed Trapp was a fine man. He was very, he wasn't a particular brilliant or anything like that, but he was a good, solid, uh, good, solid citizen. And uh, I, I thought a whole lot of him. He was fair, and he was a pretty good businessman. He had a good business administration. Oh, highways were beginning to be built. That was the start of building the state highway system, I believe, under Trapper. At least it was promoted.
wounded under him considerably since. That uh, there wasn't anything very much of any big happening that I know of. Following uh, Mr. Trapp was uh, Henry S. Johnson. And uh, then uh, he was impeached, and uh, William J. Holloway took over, and then uh, William H. Murray followed Mr. Holloway. Johnson was from this area, generally. Uh, he was from Perry. Yes, I know. Did you, uh, did you, you knew him, I'm sure. Very well, I knew him. Tell us something about uh, Johnson. Uh, and he wasn't a bad man, no. He was a, but he was a dreamer. And... Uh, I voted for his impeachment. I was in the Senate at the time he was impeached uh, because of, uh, he was just simply not qualified for the job. And the things were, there was a woman down there running everything, we thought, and I think she was, that she kind of told him what to do. And uh, he wasn't practical at all. He was, he was a dreamer. Now, I've got that right now. He was not a bad man. I think he was a good citizen, but he was not a good governor. I, I say that respectfully because uh, he's gone and uh, not here to defend himself, but uh, he knew that's the way I felt about him. You were under Holloway also. What uh, uh, Holloway Holloway is all right. He, uh, Holloway is a politician. Anything he could do for his friends, he did it. And uh, He didn't mind punishing his enemies. I never got any favors from him, and I never was punished by him because he and I were... Uh, personally, good friends, and uh, got along very good shape. I mean, I believe I don't call it an accomplishment, but I believe that during the Holloway administration was the first time that money was ever voted appropriated by the legislature for public schools. That it. Schools up to that time had been supported entirely by the local tax levy. And I think the first appropriation ever made for a public for a public school was made during the Holloway administration. I might have that wrong. It might have been it is about that time. I think that was in the, there wasn't anything particularly outstanding about his administration. It went along on even keel and as I say he was a politician and and uh, I worked as one, but he was a pretty good governor. Wow. And it, schools up to that time had been supported entirely by the local tax levy. And I think the first appropriation ever made for a public for a public school was made during the Holloway administration. I might have that wrong. It might have been. It is about that time, I think that was in the, There wasn't anything particularly outstanding about his administration. It went along on even keel, and as I say, he was a politician, and and uh, I worked as one, but he was a pretty good governor. Uh, were you in the, you were in the right place under Murray? Yeah, under Mr. Murray, under Alpha Alpha Bill. I think he was a good governor. I, uh, he was pulling some crazy stunts and so forth about, uh, but uh, uh, he had a lot to contend with, and I think it, uh, he was honest, absolutely honest, and he wasn't a bad governor. I, uh, he made a lot of enemies and all that, but uh, he and I were always, although it was his son that I ran against for, for governor, I was always high on the uh, Oh, Mr. Murray, he, uh, he peculiar, did a lot to show stuff that created talk and so forth. He did it for that purpose, and but he was he was all right. Well, I, my partner in the newspaper business at that time was Terry Marlin. He was secretary of the Democrat. Central Committee in Pawnee County, and a very active Democrat. And one day, uh, Governor Murray came in, and 
town on some sort of business, and he came in. And, uh, of course, he was visiting with Mr. Marlin, and uh, I was present. And well, as he got up to Mr. Marlin's desk and shook hand and everything, uh, Mr. Marlin said, How are you, Governor? Uh, how's your health? How are you feeling? He said, it's none of your damn business. You don't care anything about my health. <laughs> that, was one, <laughs> that was one thing. And, of course, that kind of took Mr. Marlin back. Another day, I've heard of the story of the fellow, people in Anadarko told me that he was in a restaurant down there and ordered a steak for lunch, I think it was steak, dinner. And they had a lot of had it all dressed up and uh, had a lot of green stuff around on his plate. Uh, kind of decorated it up, made it look pretty. And he just took his plate and held it up over the table and raked that stuff off the floor. <laughs> he throws things like that to aggravate people because they talk about it. I think that is the story of it. He was a good man, though. That was the last judgment he served on this thing. Yeah. No, you you a little bit wrong about that because we did have twelve Republicans out of forty four members down there and I don't think they have any more of that. So we had twelve in there at one time. However also we had six at one time. Oh they uh, they're not any particular problems. There's uh, only in one or two occasions did I ever see a political a divide along political line. No more occasions than that, but not too many. Uh, they always were uh, very courteous to me, and uh, we just got along fine and that was everything. I torment them to death. That you're, you don't have the responsibility if you're in the minority that you do if you're in the majority. And uh, the minority is, uh, is always the one that can do the persecuting and the teasing and so forth, which we did plenty of. And I remember that... And one time I had a bill in there, a hand bill, calling attention that the League of Young Democrats were going to have a meeting that night. And I got up and read it for them and invited all of them to come to the League of Young Democrats. And I said, bring your own liquor. This B-Y-O-L on here. They forgot to put it on, but that means bring your own liquor. <laughs> they, uh, they'd always take those things in good grace. It's... Uh, they're not much fellas. They, uh, I had a bill there that I wanted, was particularly interested in. I didn't hesitate about going and talking to them about it. Of course, if they, if they couldn't be found out, they wasn't going to please them. You better not start it. You better do some more campaigning before you introduced it. One time, when I recall it, we had a strictly party vote. In those days, all the black folks were Republicans, or I'd say 95% of them. And they wouldn't let them register to vote down around uh, Bowie and uh, in Muskogee and where there's heavy Negro population. They just wouldn't, they'd uh, tell them the books were closed. Or I don't have the book with me today. And they'd come in a week from Tuesday and so forth like that, and they wouldn't get to register. So they brought, they prosecuted them some registrars and election board members for not letting me go vote. Well, Tom Anglin was a Democrat floor leader, and he introduced a bill in there to appropriate some state money to defend those election board officials who denied the blacks the right to vote. And, of course, all the Republicans voted against it, and all the Democrats voted for it. That's one time I remember that there was a division. Now it would probably be the other way, but... Uh, but that, the, the blacks at that time were, well, they didn't want to be called blacks then. They wanted to be called Negroes. That was the aftermath of the Civil War, I believe. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. It, 
carried over even up till then. Then. Senator Austin from Aldis, uh, Bill Ogden from Enid, Ross Risley from Guyland, and uh, I don't know, there's a lot of good men in the Senate there when I was there. I don't think any of them. Uh, Bill Stigler went to Congress and uh, two or three members went to Congress. Of six Republicans in the legislature and one in the Senate that I had one time when I was down there, there's just six of us, four of us were Republican candidates for governor, nominated. Ross Ridley, William J. Ogden, Ira Hill, and myself. Oh, that was after I'd been out of the Senate in several years, yes. Let's see, it was, I left the Senate in 32 and uh, 33, and uh, this was 1950, so it's been uh, 18, 17, 18 years. Oh, I'd been uh, more or less active in politics all along, and uh, I... I guess I was receptive when uh, uh, some of the, my friends acted like they wanted me to run. I, I'm not one of these fellows that say it, but uh, they got me into it. My friends got me into it. They wanted me to run and so forth. I, I, was, I was willing and uh, it didn't take a lot of shoving to get me into it. Who'd you run against the Republican? Oh, I had very Bruno Miller. Yeah, Bruno Miller. And I, there were two or three others, but. Uh, Bruno Miller was on a number of things. Yeah. And I, and I never knew. He was judge in Oklahoma County at one time, yeah. But I, there were several of them there. I think I carried every county in the state. I didn't have much opposition in the primary. But uh, is Bruno still alive? I don't remember. He was the other party or the other two, and I'm not sure. Phil Ferguson didn't run that year, did he? No, Phil Ferguson ran eight years later, I guess. Yeah. He didn't make much of a race. No, I didn't. Uh, I I think I carried every county in the state in the primary. Uh, I don't think I lost any. I may have lost one or two, but if it, uh, it was by a very small vote. You ran a very good race in the uh, in the general election. Uh, I I received about forty nine percent of the vote. Yeah, well, I, that was an advantage to me in certain areas. Yeah, they uh, it's been a hard primary campaign, and uh, that, of course, was to my advantage. You ran the year that Bill Alexander ran for Senate. Yeah. Oh, yes, we campaigned together quite a lot, yes. Tell something about Bill Alexander. Uh, Bill was quite a, he was another showman. And uh, he was good, he was smart. And uh, I think he would have made a good senator. I don't think there's 
any doubt about that. He was a conservative sort of a fellow. But I'll always say, he liked to fly. We flew all over the state quite a little, and that's, you see, 20 years ago, and flying wasn't as common as it is now. But he told a story of one time he was in, one time, uh, I think he's in Kansas City, and he was in a hotel, and he asked the porter, or but the porter went to help him take some of his baggage out, and he said, "Are you going to fly? Or are you going to fly out of here, Mr. Alexander?" And he said, "Yes." We said, "I wouldn't do that, Roger." He said, "Why?" He said, "It's too dangerous." Bill said, "Oh, I'm a Presbyterian along that line. If..." They got my, if they call my number, it's going to get me regardless where I am. He said, yes, Mr. Alexander, but suppose they call that pilot's number and you're in that plane. And, and incidentally, Bill was killed in an airplane wreck later on. Yeah. He was a good man. Yeah, yeah I liked him. Steve, we have our next interview at one, so we'll we'll probably break there. And I sure appreciate very much. This has been an interview with uh, Mr. Joe Ferguson uh, in Pawnee, Oklahoma. The date being September fifteenth, nineteen seventy-one. Do things pretty well, and he he didn't he didn't take a a homestead. And he was not qualified. I don't think he was qualified to take a farm homestead. But he saw around town there was a fellow homesteaded a lot, and he put up a grocery store, and another one next to him put up a blacksmith shop, and another one put in a newspaper, and. Uh, all kind of, another one put in a saloon, another in a drugstore, and so forth, and he said he wanted to go in business, and he didn't know exactly what to do. But the sign he decided he'd put in a bank. Well, he had a tent, and he stretched it on the lot that he homesteaded, entered, got him a goods box to sit on, took a shingle and rolled on the bank and hung it on the tent, outside the tent, and sat down on the goods box and waited for customers to come in. And there was, the first customer came in and after an hour or two and left $10. And that was all he got that day. And the next day, there's a man come in and left $20. He said the third day, there was a man come in and left $50. And he just gave him so damn much confidence, he put in $10 that customer <laughs> the, uh, uh, do you recall any of the other experiences that, uh, that uh, Mr. Barry told about? Oh yes, he told about the first Indian that died here. The Indians and the Pawnees were in the habit of burying their, of putting their dead above ground and covering with rock. And they hadn't been here very long. Well, they'd been here quite a while, I guess, but they kept burying them that way or disposing of the bodies that way. And the uh, agent insisted that they should put them in a coffin and in a casket and bury them in the ground. So an old Indian died, and they got some boards at the local sawmill and made him a casket. But they made it too short, so they knocked out the end of it and let his feet stick out, and they loaded him on the running gears of a wagon and hauled him out to the cemetery. That was the first, that was his story, the first Indian was buried here. I do know that uh, after I came here, they discovered uh, some skeletons out east of town, which were said to have been Indians that had been buried above ground. And, one of them was a uh, skull was brought in here and 
I believe a complete skeleton was brought in here and left at the high school by one of the scholars some 50 years ago. That has been probably 50 years after the after the uh, Indian died. The, uh, tell about the earlier days of your Oh, uh, Mr. Marlin and Mr. Kerr and I bought the Curry Dispatch in 1922, I believe it was. Well, later on, Mr. Kerr, uh, I told uh, Mr. Marlin, and then Mr. Kerr told uh, Mr. Marlin, and a few years later, I went in the newspaper business at Cleveland. That is, I still continue to live here, but I had a partner, and he was in the paper over there. Then in 1940, I came, I came back and uh, put in a, an established uh, Pawnee chief. And uh, I remember that it was a little hard about getting subscriptions, so I hit on the idea that uh, everybody would bring in a live possum. I'd make him give me a year's subscription. And I had possums running out of my ears that fall. I remember we got a chicken cup, and I had, at one time, I had six chicken cups full of possums out in front of the, uh, of the newspaper office. But I sure built that a prescription, subscription list. Did you give renewal for possums? No, no, that, that ended. It was the first paper was all in it. It didn't last but, oh, six weeks or something like that. That's how it went. It was just simply a stunt. And uh, I gave the, I uh, turned most of the possums loose and gave them away. They uh, got too big a problem to feed. When did you uh, join the politics? Oh, I've been interested in politics all my life. I was interested in politics when I lived in Missouri. I ran for county clerk when I was 21 years old in Missouri and got beat, I remember, by 11 votes. <laughs> and I thought, I, and uh, I guess it was a good thing. Later on, I was in the newspaper business back there for a while. Then I was in the Postal Service until I went into the uh, Army in World War in 1917. And, uh, so when I went to Oklahoma politics, well, about as soon as I got out here, I guess, I don't know, I was interested in them. I attended state conventions and the county conventions from the time I landed here, and I and have continued it. I think everybody should be interested in politics, uh, maybe not, maybe to a limited extent, but it's politics is everybody's business. It's the uh, science of government, and uh, the government is the biggest business that we have. And if we don't elect the right kind of people and take their proper interest in it, we can't expect to have good government. Well, I was a member of the city council in Pawnee. Uh, what year was that? 24. 24. Uh, what were some of the problems that you dealt with in, in, at that time as a member of the city council? Oh, having enough money to run the, just like it is now, just like it is now, having enough money to run the, operate things. Of course, we didn't try to spread out as much as we did now. We didn't didn't spend money like we do now. We didn't have the facilities. We didn't have, we had a pretty good water system that had been provided for, but it went sour on us. And later on, after I was off the council, they had to change and put in a big lake. And we have a good, we have a good water system now, about 100, uh, 100 acres of lake or 110, something like that, up north down. And it's, it never has, we've never been short of water since. We were short, we used to get out of the Black Bear when I came here, and the uh, oil companies polluted the stream up around Garber and up toward Enid. And uh, then they paid from, uh, they were sued by the McCollum McCollum lawyers representing the city of Pawnee, and a judgment was obtained sufficient to build this a big lake up north town, and that's the way Incidentally, they had an old courthouse when I came here, an old stone courthouse, and while I was in the Senate, I introduced a bill to levy a two mill tax, or a mill tax, and to take all the court, and take the court fund 
and hold that levee in the front until a sufficient amount was accumulated to build a courthouse. Now, that was unconstitutional if anybody wanted to contest it. But the oil companies and the big taxpayers thought it'd be easier to pay for uh, pay a small levy than it would be to pay interest on bonds for a long time. So when sufficient money was accumulated, the present courthouse was built. And it's a nice structure. Yeah. And it was paid for the day, that, the day it was built. It was paid for. It never was any... And I take considerable pride in that, to that got that done. Incidentally, there's the first, the only highway that I know of in Oklahoma that is built by an act of the state legislature was in Pawnee County. The uh, McElroy Township in this county voted bonds to build the highway. Well, the commissioners didn't know much about that. At that time, we had township government. The township trustees didn't know very much about building roads, and most of that money, or a good part of it, was squandered before then. The road didn't last over, her, over two or three months after they had it built. A hard, uh, they put what they called a hard surface road there, but it wasn't very hard. And that money laid there in the, county, in the township treasury for two or three years, and I introduced a bill in the legislature to require the State Highway Commission to take that money and to add to it such money as was necessary and build a paved highway through McElroy Township, north to south. Um, William H. Murray, off Alpha Bill, was governor at the time, and he wouldn't sign the bill, but he did let it become a law by, uh, after the legislature adjourned, and it became a law. And the Highway Commission not only built that highway, but they also built it made it a part of uh, the state highway in 99, and uh, that's the way a good uh, part of that state highway 99 was financed. You said quite a number of years in the Senate. What years did you serve? I was in the Senate from 1925 to 1933. And uh, so in 1925, who was that? Was that uh, Ed Trapp. Yeah. Uh, was, uh, were, were you under, uh, under Johnson, under Walton? No, Walton was out the year before I went in. Ed Trapp became governor. He was lieutenant governor, and Walton was impeached. Tell us something about Ed Trapp. Oh, Ed Trapp was a fine man. He was very, he wasn't a particular brilliant or anything like that, but he was a good, solid, uh, good, solid citizen. And, uh, I, I thought a whole lot of him. He was fair, and he was a pretty good businessman. He had a good business administration. What were the principal things that happened during that administration? Oh, highways were beginning to be built. That was the start of building the state highway system, I believe, under Trapper. At least it was promoted under him to a considerable extent. That uh, There wasn't anything very much of any big happenings that I know of. Following uh, Mr. Trapp was uh, Henry S. Johnson. And uh, then uh, he was impeached and uh, William J. Holloway took over and then uh, William H. Murray followed Mr. Holloway. Johnson was from this area generally. Uh, he was from Perry. Very well, I knew him. Uh, and he wasn't a bad man, no. He was a, but he was a dreamer, and uh, I voted for his impeachment. I was in the Senate at the time he was impeached uh, because of it. he was just simply not qualified for the job. And the things were there was a woman down there running everything. We thought, and I think she was that she kind of told him what to do and. Uh, he wasn't practical at all. He was, he was a dreamer. Now, I've got that right now. He was not a bad man. I think he was a good citizen, but, but he's not a good governor. He's, I, I say that respectfully because uh, he's gone and uh, not here to defend himself, but uh, he knew that's the way I felt about him. You were under Holloway also. What uh, uh, Holloway about him? Holloway is all right. He, uh, Holloway is a politician. 
Anything he could do for his friends, he did it. And so he didn't mind punishing his enemies. I never got any favors from him, and I never was punished by him because he and I were uh, personally good friends and uh, got along very good shape. I mean, I believe, I don't call it an accomplishment, but I believe that during the Holloway administration was the first time that money was ever voted, appropriated by the legislature for public schools. That it, schools up to that time had been supported entirely by the local tax levy. And I think the first appropriation ever made for a public, for a public school was made during the hall. Yeah, under Mr. W under Alfalfa Bill. I think he was a good governor. I uh, he was pulled some crazy stunts and so forth, but, uh, but uh, uh, he had a lot to contend with, and I think it, uh, he was honest, absolutely honest, and he wasn't a bad governor. I, uh, he made a lot of enemies and all that, but uh, he and I were always, although it was his son that I ran against for, for governor, I was always high on the uh, Oh, Mr. Murray, he, uh, he's peculiar, did a lot of show stuff that created talk and so forth. He did it for that purpose, and but he, he was all right. How about some of your stuff? Well, I, my partner in the newspaper business at that time was Terry Marlin. He was secretary of the Democrat Central Committee in Pawnee County, and a very active Democrat. And one day, uh, Governor Murray came in, in town on some sort of business, and he came in. And, uh, of course, he was visiting with Mr. Marlin, and uh, I was present. And, well, as he got up to Mr. Marlin's desk and shook hands and everything, uh, Mr. Marlin said, how are you, Governor? How's your health? How are you feeling? He said, it's none of your damn business. You don't care anything about my health. <laughs> that, was one, that was one thing. <laughs> of course, that kind of took Mr. Marlin back. Another thing I've heard of the story, the fellow, people in Anadarko told me that he was in a restaurant down there and ordered a steak or lunch, I think it was steak, dinner. And they had a lot of, had it all dressed up, and had a lot of green stuff around on his plate, uh, kind of decorated up, making it look pretty. And he just took his plate and held it out over the table and raked that stuff off on the floor. <laughs> he throws things like that to aggravate people because they talk about it. I think that is the story of it. He was a good man, though. That was the last governor you served under. Senator. Yeah, he was last served. Of those governors you served under, who would you say was the greatest governor? Oh, Murray. As a, um, you were a, uh, uh, you were always a minority, minority senator. Uh, yeah. What, uh, what are some of the problems of being, and you were uh, more a minority senator then than a Republican would be today by a long shot. Uh, no, you're, you're a little bit wrong about that because we did have 12 Republicans out of 44 members down there, and I don't think they have any more than that. Uh, we had 12 in there at one time. However, also we had six at one time. Oh, uh, they're not any particular problems. There's, uh, only in one or two occasions did I ever see a political, a divide along a political line. No more occasions than that, but not too many. Uh, they always were uh, very courteous to me, and uh, we just got along fine about everything. I torment them to death. You're, you don't have the responsibility if you're in the minority that you do if you're in the majority. And uh, minorities, 
is always the one that can do the persecuting and the teasing and so forth, which we did plenty of. And I remember that one time I had a bill in there, a handbill calling attention that the League of Young Democrats were going to have a meeting that night, and I got up and read it for them. Uh, and invited all of them to come to the League of Young Democrats. And I said, bring your own liquor. This B-Y-O-L on here. They forgot to put it on, but that means bring your own liquor. <laughs> they, uh, they'd they always take those things in good grace. It's, uh, they're nice bunch of fellows. They, uh, well, I had a bill to, that I wanted, was particularly interested in. I didn't hesitate about going and talking to them about it. Of course, if, they, if he couldn't, if he found out that it wasn't going to please him, he better not start it and better do some more campaigning before he introduced it. One time, when I recall that we had a strictly party vote, in those days, all the black folks were Republicans, or I'd say 95% of them, and they wouldn't let them register to vote down around uh, Bowley and, uh, and uh, Muskogee and where there's heavy Negro population. They just wouldn't, they'd, uh, Tell them the books are closed, or I don't have the book with me today, and they come in a week from Tuesday and so forth like that, and they wouldn't get to register. So they brought, they prosecuted some some registrars and election board members for not letting Negroes vote. Well, Tom Anglin was a Democrat floor leader, and he introduced a bill in there to appropriate some state money to defend those election board officials who denied the blacks the right to vote. And, of course, all the Republicans voted against it, and all the Democrats voted for it. That's one time I remember that there was a division. Now it would probably be the other way, but uh, but that's the, the blacks at that time were, well, they didn't want to be called blacks then. They wanted to be called Negroes. That was the aftermath of the Civil War, I guess. Oh, yes, yeah, that's right. That's right. It carried over even up till then, yeah. Oh, uh, Tom Anglin, Senator Austin from Aldis, uh, Bill Otgen from Enid, Ross Risley from Guyman, and uh, I don't know, there are a lot of good men in the Senate uh, when I was there. I don't think any of them uh, Bill Stigler went to Congress, and uh, two or three members went to Congress. Of six Republicans in the legislature and one in the Senate, and I had one time when I was down there, there were just six of us. Four of us were Republican candidates for governor, nominated. Ross Ridley, William J. Ogden, Ira Hill, and myself. <laughs> like they wanted me to run. I, I'm not one of these fellows that say it, but they got me into it. My friend got me into it. They wanted me to run and so forth. I, I was I was willing, and uh, it didn't take a lot of shoving to get me into it. Who'd you run against in the 
said, hey, Bruno Miller. Yeah, Bruno Miller. And I, there was two or three others, but... Uh, Bruno Miller is on a number of times. Yeah. He was judge in Oklahoma County at one time, yeah. But I, there were several of them there. I think I carried every county in the state. I didn't have much opposition in the primary. But uh, is Bruno still alive? I don't remember. We, we ought to probably interview a few. I'm not sure. Phil Ferguson didn't run that year, did he? No, Phil Ferguson ran and later. eight years later, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't make much race. The, uh, you didn't have really much competition in the uh, in the Republican campaign. No, I didn't. Uh, I I think I carried every county in the state in the primary. Uh, I don't think I lost any. I may have lost one or two, but if it, uh, it was by a very small vote. You ran a very good race in the uh, in the general election. Uh, I I received about forty nine percent of the vote. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, that was an advantage to me in certain areas, yeah. They, uh, they'd been a hard primary campaign. Yeah. And uh, that, of course, was to my advantage. You ran the year that Bill Alexander ran for Senate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, did, did, you, uh, did you campaign together with him? Oh, yes, we campaigned together quite a lot, yes. Tell something about Bill Alexander. Uh, Bill was quite a, he was not a showman. And uh, he was good, he was smart. And uh, I think he would have made a good senator. I don't think there's any doubt about that. He was a conservative sort of a fellow. But I'll always say, he liked to fly. We flew, oh, the state quite a little, and that's, you see, 20 years ago, and flying wasn't as common as it is now. But he told a story of one time he was in, one time, uh, I think he's in Kansas City, and he's in a hotel, and he asked the porter, or, but the porter went to help him take some of his baggage out, and he said, are you going to fly, or are you going to fly out of here, Mr. Alexander, and he said, yes. We said, I wouldn't do that right here. He said, why? He said, it's too dangerous. Bill said, oh, I'm a Presbyterian along that line. If they got my, if they call my number, it's going to get me regardless where I am. He said, yes, Mr. Alexander, but suppose they call that pilot's number and you're in that plane. And and incidentally, Bill was killed in an airplane wreck later on. Yeah. He was a good man. Yeah. Good friend of mine. Yeah, I liked him. The, uh, I believe we have our next interview at 1, so we'll, we'll probably break there. And I sure appreciate very much. This has been an interview with uh, Mr. Joe Ferguson uh, in Pawnee, Oklahoma, the date being September 15, 1971. That's right.